Well, the Super Bowl is uh, next weekend. It's going to be an awesome time here at the Rise. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, so I encourage you, uh, think about somebody you can bring with you. Um, it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and so don't miss next weekend. But today, I have a word that I believe is going to equip many of you. So if you have your Bibles, go and open up to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to preach one verse to you. Is that okay? I mean, not that you can really do anything about it sitting in your seats, but, uh, you know, but here's the thing about preaching just one verse. You preach one verse and like, so it's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And uh, you preach one verse and I'm like, you know, how does verse 9 feel about that? Like, does nine, verse 9 get a little sad that it doesn't get any attention or any love? And so for the sake of verse 9 and the eight verses before that, I'm going to give you a little bit of context this morning. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing right now and uh, he is... A legend of the faith. He started off his time here on this planet um, persecuting and killing Christians. And he had this radical moment where like this light beam came down and he couldn't see. And then he got his sight back and started preaching about Jesus. Really, really cool story. You can read about it in the book of Acts. But he's writing to a church. And uh, this church that he's writing to is a jacked up church. I mean, you, you want to talk about things wrong? This church right here has got it. And I'm not saying that's who we are by any means, but I think we can learn something from it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says, Now I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe it in vain. We don't want to be doing things in vain. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't waste it. Turn to your neighbor you don't like quite as much and say, don't waste it. There's judgment flowing throughout this room right now. You know, God came down here. Jesus Christ himself. The gospel happened so that we could make things happen. God wants to work in and through us. That's kind of this serious word right now. You've got what it takes. Don't waste what God has deposited in you. For I deliver to you in verse 3 our first importance, which I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. And then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10, our key verse, but... That's a big word right there. I mean, it's only got three letters, but that, that's, a, that's a big, big word right there. You know, it, it says, things once were this way, but... Now they're like this. Or maybe I, I once didn't have any hope, but now I do have hope. Or once I was going down this particular path, but God takes me on a different path. Y'all seeing the importance of this word right here? It's a transition verse or a transition word in this passage. One of my friends actually preached a message on this. He called it Paul's big butt, um, which I thought was kind of funny. And uh, don't ask your neighbor what size of butt they have, because that's not appropriate. But we see here that that is a transition moment. Paul's talking about all this stuff, and he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. The title of the message, if you're taking notes today, uh, is present in the present process. And that sounds a little confusing. I'm going to reference a gift as if you get a present. And then the time frame, the present. There is a present in the present process. Okay. You know, all of us are going through different things right now. All of us have different obstacles in front of us. And there's something that's happening in the present process that you're going through. You know, you know Paul is kind of bragging a little bit. Now. He, he's, he's about to do what I call the humble brag. I don't know if any of you experienced that. It's, it's what I call the, uh, the humble brag. And what he's doing in this is he's trying to get the church to live out what God has put in them. We got this church. It's got some mistakes happening. It's got some things taking place in it. People aren't perfect. Welcome to this church. No perfect people allowed. But God has put things.
things inside of them and has put things inside of you. And Paul is trying to stir people up right now that what God has deposited in you, you can use that for things to further the gospel and to further the work of Christ in this globe. And you know, I've, I've learned that many times it's the process that throws things off. We talked about relationships a little earlier. Let's talk about relationships for a moment. You know, you get married. It's beautiful, hopefully. I mean, it's a nice day. Even if it's raining, it's a beautiful day in your mind. You know, you say, I do. You say your vows. It's wonderful. And then like year, we'll call it year seven, happens. And all of a sudden, things begin to be a little bit trickier. You begin to think about how things are going, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I cannot believe he let the van run out of gas again. I've been driving the same van for the past seven years. How does he not know it's going to run out of gas? Why didn't he fill up? And don't, leave, you don't even let me begin to talk about all the socks you've been throwing on the ground over here for the last, I'm not your mom. You pick them up. Anybody been there? Don't raise your hand if you're sitting next to your spouse. That, real. that hand went up so quick. I don't know who it was. Somewhere over here. Pray for them. This area. This is the prayer corner right here. But it's the process. In that process, there's the struggle that's going on. Or you have a job. And it's not this catastrophic moment that happens that leads you to the ending of that job. It's just little things happening moment by moment. This process that leads to you leaving that job or deciding that's not going to be what you want to do. Well, let's talk about babies for a minute. Love it. I mean, it starts off all sweet. Like, yeah, you do the we're pregnant announcement, and everybody gives you a like on Instagram, and it's wonderful. And then you have the, the gender reveal party, which I didn't know that was a thing. Apparently, that's a, that's a thing now. You throw a party for what the baby's going to be. Anyways. And, and really exciting. It's, it's beautiful. And, you know, I can get behind that a little bit. And then you, 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 you pick out the name, you do all this stuff, and then you go to the hospital, and then the process starts. You get home and you got to process through what they've processed and you get diapers all over the place and then you are up late at night and you got red eyes so because you're not sleeping so because the red eyes you need Red Bull and you know you're, you're going through the process. You know what I'm saying? And then once they start walking it's really easy after that, right? <laughs> Woo! Parents, if you're sitting next to your kids, tell them they're part of your process. <laughs> the process. The process can be difficult. And even with a certain church, you know, you, you want to be involved in what God's doing here. And as you're in the process of it, you're seeing other people are dropping out of the process. And so you wonder if because they're dropping out of the process, you should drop out of the process. And then the process, the grinding of the process is where things happen. And there's something that Jesus has done that really stirs us up as you're in this process. So let, let's look at at this Corinth church for a moment, that they're understanding what it's like to be a Christian in tough times. I mean, you all know that too, being here in 2018, you realize that the majority of this country, and I'll say this planet, is not gospel friendly, right? You look at the different social issues at hand, you look at different parts of the educational system and, and how our worldview is looking, it doesn't seem to be compatible to what the scriptures say. And so we have to learn how to process through an unchristian world with a Christian worldview. And the same thing is happening with this Corinthian church. They, they are starting to understand that the rest of the world doesn't see exactly how they see it. And they're starting to understand there's a little bit more to it than just going through your daily grind. And there's a part in this passage that I had difficulty processing through. And I got some clarity on it, and I believe that in that clarity I got, there's a message. I'm okay with the majority of this passage. You know, actually, I'm okay with all of it. Because we don't want to be against part of it. But, you know, in the beginning it says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I Okay, we, we say yes to the gospel in verse 1. Verse 2, um, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Okay, we understand the word got given to Paul. Now Paul preaches to other people. Uh, in verse 3, he talks about the fact that Christ died. In verse 4, he talks about that he was raised the dead, raised the dead on the third day. On verse 5, it talks about how he appeared to some of his followers. Verse 6, 500 followers. Verse 7, he appears to his half-brother. Verse 8, he appears to Paul. But in verse 9, this is what's interesting. It says in verse 9, 
For I am the least of the apostles. If I was to say, name an apostle, who's the first person that comes to mind? Paul. I mean, he did, in fact, write 17 of the 23 books of the New Testament. I mean, he is like the superstar apostle. You could have said Bartholomew. None of y'all probably would have thought that. He was one of them. He was equally qualified to answer that question. But Paul is somebody we would think of being an apostle. He says, I don't feel qualified, or I am the least of these apostles, yet... He's probably the most qualified in that. And it's not like Paul was fresh in the game right here. It's not like this was, you know, Paul, he used to hate Christians, and he killed Christians, and he had a radical conversion experience. This is not during that moment. Paul's been planting churches and traveling around and doing things for 30 years at this point. Like, Paul is in his element. Why does he say, I am one of the least of those? I'm the least likely to be called that. I'm the least likely to be an apostle. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like he's the, he's feeling inside that he's the, like the little boy trying to put on big boy shoes. You can see, see, here's what Paul knows. Paul knows something about himself that we don't know. Paul knows who he is behind all of the accolades. It's one thing to look at somebody from the exterior, but when we look at Paul, we see him as this great person, but he knows who he is deep inside. And... Paul says, I'm the least of these apostles. That's kind of like the singer who says, like comes up here on stage and like nails the solo and does really, really great. And you talk to him afterwards, you're like, hey, great job singing that song. We're like, oh, it was nothing. And you're like, yes, it was absolutely something. It was incredible. Um, the inverse is when people think they can sing and they, they really can't and they need a friend to tell them they should probably keep their mouth shut. But Paul is not like that. Paul is an apostle of apostle. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, he is the real deal. Are you getting the point right now? So he says this statement, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. And here's where the conundrum happens to me. He says that, and then right afterwards in verse 10, he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that's within me. So in one statement, he says, By the grace of God, I am. It's God's grace. Thankful for his grace. I need his grace in my life. And then with the same verse, he says, I worked harder than any of them. Do you, do you see that pattern that's going on right there? That, that, that almost conflict. In one side it's saying it's all about the grace of Jesus. And on the other side it's all about the effort that I'm putting forth. And so the question, which is it, Paul? Is it more about the grace of Jesus? Or is it more about the effort that you're putting forth? But which one is it? And I would submit to you this morning that it's not one or the other, but it's both of Because I've seen people that hop on the grace train. You've seen them too. You're like, hey, how come we haven't been to church in 13 years? They're like, oh, me and God are tight. We're good. I mean, he speaks to me. You know, like when, I, when I'm watching football, he's like my quarterback. So, I mean, he's, he guides me. I, I got it. He's, he's, me and him, we're tight. You're like, you haven't even opened your Bible or been to church or done anything. It's, you can get this grace mentality. The grace of God is a real thing. But we cannot abuse the grace of God that's coming to our life. And if there's certain wrestles or certain struggles or certain things we're going through, we can't just cover it underneath the grace of God. There actually needs to be a little bit of effort as well. But on the same sense, when Paul says right here, Paul says, I work harder than any of them. We can't be so far on the working side that we say it's all about me, myself, and I and what I do. Because then you can start to say, well, look at how great I am and look down on everybody else and start to judge them. And Paul wraps up that verse saying, though it was not I, but the grace of God that's within me. So it's not one or the other. In fact, it's both of those things at the exact same time. Paul said, I understand grace, but I'm going to work in the present process right now. I'm going to say that again because I think somebody needs to, to, to understand this this morning. Paul understands the magnitude of grace in his life, but he also understands that he needs to work the process that's going on. And God has given us all a measure of grace, but he's also called us to work 
the process or the situation or the life that you're in right now. And what I love is that before he says this, and this is where this all kind of comes together right here. Paul says, for I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because, here's the reason why he comes to this, because I persecuted the church of God. You see, Paul knew his backstory. Paul knew what he had gone through. Paul knew all of the struggles, and it was because of the magnitude and the intensity of his struggles and sins that he understood the magnitude and intensity of God's grace. You see somebody who's on fire for God and they get really excited about it, usually you can go back and you can look today and experience the grace of God in a huge way, and it's that grace, that understanding of the grace that propels them to work in the process of the future. I'm preaching a lot better than you all are responding right now. You all have been through things. You have been through struggles. You know, and I'm not 100% sure what they are. But what I do know is those things that God has rescued you from. Those things that, that you don't want anybody to know about. Maybe they're behind closed doors. Maybe they're all over the internet. I don't know what it is. But those things, it's that grace in that moment that should stir you up for the things that are to come. And for the process that you're currently walking through. Amen. You cannot forget where you came from. And we see that right here. That Paul, in the midst of encouraging this church. In the midst of trying to get this church up and going. He's saying, look where I came from. Look what I was. No one would have ever thought I was the one preaching about the gospel. No one would have ever thought I was going to be a Christian. But God. God came in and changed the game for me. And that is why I can walk the way that I do right now. If anybody's experienced that, make some noise right now. <laughs> a child just shouted me down. You know, there's, there's a spiritual element of shouting people down. Uh, it means you love Jesus. Is what it means. No, I'm just kidding. You cannot do that and love Jesus. You just, uh, you love him more if you do that. Um, we look at God's grace right here. And you know, there's common grace that he gives to all mankind. There's his grace of salvation that he gives us. And there's specific grace. There's grace that God gives you to walk through a specific season of your life during a specific time with specific situations. And that grace in that process can birth something absolutely beautiful out of it. Let me give you an example for a second. All right. Um, come follow me around for a second. You got a bag. And you know, um, I, uh, I'm sat in the second row. Great choice. You know, I'm not a, can I get one of these, these bow? Okay, so you know, I, uh, I don't know um, what exactly, how do I do these things? Here we go. They, they're like child-proofing these bows right now. Here we go. So I, I don't know what particular process you're going through right now. I don't know what your present process looks like. But what I do know is we're, we're going, let's say we're with an extra grace for you know those EGR people. Not that we have any of those people in this church because we're not that kind of church. Everyone's great. Um, no, no issues at all. But um, you know that person that kind of tests you to your limit and you're like, Ugh! and you see him coming and you don't want to talk to him and so you, you walk the other direction because that's what Jesus would have done, right? Um, in that moment, there's a gift in that moment. That person that you don't necessarily want to talk with or you don't necessarily want to deal with, perhaps that's the person that's stirring you on to have the love of Jesus in your life toward them like no, never before. And what that is, is that is actually, it's a present in your present process. You're looking at it being just a process, but actually God's doing a work inside of you. And so really it's just a, we're going to, there we go. It is a present in the present process. You look good with that. All right, we're going to come over here for a second. You know, um, all right, you saw me. Here we go. I know you guys. This is dangerous. So you have, you have many children. You have three of them. They're all girls. Mike, we're praying for you. I have no tips, but we're praying for you. You're going to go for a fourth? I shouldn't ask that for everybody. So um, you got kids, and, and, and they're, 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 just, they're, they're, they're keeping you up at night. You're like, oh, God, why? You have the opportunity in that moment, during that process, to literally invest in a generation, to literally shape the future of the Sigmund family. 
So uh, it might just seem like a process that's never ending. I'm at home with my kids and I live in the middle of nowhere so no one ever comes and visits me because I know where your guys' house is. Maybe in that moment, it's not so much as a process of redundancy, but it's actually God's giving you a present in that we're going to need process. Oh, <laughs> uh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Who do we see? Oh, uh, we'll go over here. Good morning. See, second row was kind of frustrated, but second row is excited right now to move a little bit further back. Dentist appointment. Uh, have you been to the dentist recently? You have. How'd it go? Not particularly well. What'd they do? A root canal. Lord have mercy. Okay, here we go. Don't you love how the dentist talks to you in that moment? They put instruments of death in your mouth. They're like, hey, how's your weekend going? What do you have planned next summer? And you're like, whoa, 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 it's terrible. But in that moment, maybe you're getting a chance to rest and meditate for a second and be thankful for the gifts that God's given you to have health care in this area where you can get a root canal taken out and so you don't have to worry about your tooth hurting for the rest of your life. In that moment, you can turn it from a spot of complaining to a spot of praise. You can take it for God. I'm so thankful for all these things that have happened in my life. This is a present for the present process. Are you getting this idea right now? That even in the darkest moments, even in the hardest, you know, God can say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with my job right now. There's that person that I can't stand to, to, to work with, that person that tries me right now. Or, or how about that person doesn't like you? You ever experienced that? You thought you were safe on the side. That person doesn't like you. I love who I'm not saying you're not a likable guy by any means, but, there, but there's somebody who just, for whatever reason, they just they, they don't like who you are, and you're really, really wanting them to like you, and maybe God's trying to break you of this desire to be accepted by people, and for you to actually walk into your calling and who you are. And so there's a present, oh, this is a bald head, wonderful, in the process. Thank you, I appreciate that. We'll go one more. Here we go. Catch. I can't throw <laughs> We're in this series right now called You've Got What It Takes. And many times we have these preconceived ideas of what God is supposed to be doing or what we are supposed to be doing. You ever had that? Where you thought you knew exactly how things were going to be and exactly what was going to take place? Maybe God is doing more work in you in this process and that's actually what's going to develop you to have what it takes to make it through the next season many times we can get so caught up in the grace or the giftings of God and we're looking for the next piece of grace and we're going to invite the worship team back up right now we're looking for the next gifting we're looking for the next season we're looking for the next thing always looking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing meanwhile God is doing something in this season and this moment right here and I just want to let somebody know this morning that God is working in your life, even in the seasons where you don't necessarily see him working. That's right. And we see Paul. You can give God some praise for that. Let me meet it. We see Paul right here in the midst of his apostleship. He is on assignment right here. He is literally, we're reading real time, him writing the Bible. And in that moment, he's saying, you know, I don't necessarily feel worthy in this moment. I look at all the other people and I'm thinking, God, there's no way you can use somebody like me. God, God, I, I know my past. I don't have what it takes, but for God's grace. And when God's grace comes on the scene, it flips everything around. And he will give you the grace to be able to withstand and persevere through your current process. The danger can be when you waste his grace. When God's given you the ability and the capacity to make it through things. And you kind of just sit it out. Say, God, I see how you're using this person. Or God, I see how you're giving victory over here. Or God, I see how you're developing that relationship. And usually those people are walking in obedience when all those things are happening. Yes. But God, I, I don't believe you can use me that way. 
And Jesus Christ came down here to give you the grace of salvation, yes, but to also give you the grace and the equipping to be able to walk in that moment you're struggling with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you don't step out and step forward in the obedience, you're wasting the grace that he's given you. And this is not cheap grace. This is grace that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross. And so my question for you this morning, we're asking this question, or I'll take this and turn it into a question we're asking. Do you have what it takes? And this can apply to occupational items. It can apply to parental items. It can apply to situational items. It can apply to congregational items, how we are as a church right here. Do you have what it takes? Yes. Why? Not because of anything you can boast in. Paul could have boasted. Remember, he's the Hebrew of Hebrews. He's got it all together. But he didn't boast in those things, did he? Because those things will never, ever quite be enough. Or there'll always be somebody better. Or there'll be a challenge that's a little bit more than how great you think you are. Paul said, but for the grace of God. And so what are you doing with that grace that God has deposited deep inside of you? Are you using it for what he's called you to use it for? And I'm going to piggyback off that. That God's grace is more than just situational. There's another measure to his grace that has to deal with our soul in general. We're talking about do you have what it takes? I'm going to kind of flip this a little bit. Do you have what it takes to access eternal paradise? Do you have what it takes to access heaven? According to the scriptures in the book of Romans, no. None of us do. No one's righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have separated ourselves from God because of the mistakes in our life. And it says the penalty of sin is death, but the free gift of God, his grace, is eternal life. And so if you were to ask that question as far as your eternal state, what would your answer be? Do you, do you know Jesus? Have you, do you walk with him? Has he transformed you? Is he active and moving in your life? Have you believed in the fact that his death, burial, and resurrection can save you from all of your mistakes? That right there is a grace that will carry you on to eternal paradise. And so this morning, I want to give a chance for people to respond. For, for, for both sides of it. Um, and so I, uh, I, I want you just to go ahead and bow your heads across this auditorium right now. And I'm going to ask the, the first question is when it comes to the abuse of grace. And no one's looking around. I just want you to process to yourself right now. You know, God has saved you and set you free and empowered you to be victorious and he's given you the present of this present process are you walking in it with grace or are you abusing it and if you're abusing it you would say God I need, I need a perspective shift I need to walk in your grace a little bit more I need to see what you're teaching me in those moments if that's you I want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for thank you God you can go ahead and put your hands down right now I'm going to ask the second question right now. Maybe you've never experienced the grace of God. Maybe you're not sure exactly if God has come into your life. If you were to wrap up your time here on earth, you're not exactly sure where you stand in the spectrum of eternity. You haven't accepted Jesus' grace. If you want to do that today or you want to come back to him, maybe you've been wandering for a while and you want to come back to him. I want you to raise your hand in a moment. And we're going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to walk you through that process. If you want to invite Jesus into your life or rededicate your life, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, Jesus' grace is available and it's here right now. Two, the scriptures say that today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you, raise your hand high. Thank you, God. Anyone else? You can go ahead and put your hands down. I want to go ahead and invite you all to stand with me across this auditorium.
If you raise your hand, I want you to dial in on what I'm about to talk about. Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to give you new life. Jesus came to give you a hope and a future that no one can take away from you. And we're going to pray a prayer in a moment. And this prayer is not some special saying. But what it is, is it's a declaration of what you believe inside. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And so if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this along with me. And if you've prayed it before, why don't you pray it again so they feel like they got some people around them. So would you close your eyes and pray with me. Father God, I know that I've made mistakes. And I want to come home. I want to come home to you. I need you in my life. Jesus, I know you died for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I accept your gift of salvation. And I trust you as Lord and Savior. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you believed it deep in your heart, you have literally transitioned from death to life. The scriptures say that when one person comes home, there's a party in heaven. Can we give God some praise for what he's done? I genuinely hope and pray that as you go through the next 11 months of this year, you will remember the principles from this series. That because of God's grace, you have what it takes to make it through any challenge the devil can throw at you. Two quick announcements before we uh, depart this morning. Number one, we see in the scripture that Jesus gave, and we also see in the scripture that we're supposed to give back. One tenth of what we get is called the tithe, and so if this is your church. Uh, this is a great time to do that. In a moment, the host will come down and pass the buckets. You can give here in person with cash or check. You can give online. You can text to give. All of those different ways are in your brochure. But this will be a time for us to worship the Lord through that. Secondly, uh, once a month, we do something called Welcome to the Rise. Um, that's if you're new here or you're curious about this church and you want to learn a little bit more. Uh, we have a lunch afterwards. If you registered, we're excited for you coming. If you didn't register, hey, we cook extra food. Come anyway. So after service, head out the doors. Take a left like you're going down to Rise Kids. We would love to welcome you there. Can we wrap up the first series of 2018? Just singing one more time how greatness, how greatness, how great the love of God is. That he is the name above all names. That he's worthy to be praised. There is no one like our God in heaven. So I would invite you as we wrap up this service. Would you stretch your hands high to heaven. Giving him praise for what he's doing in our life.